OK, hi there, everybody, and welcome to these lectures in PM1B, where we're going to be looking at reaction mechanisms. So my name's Professor Helen Osborne. If you ever need to contact me, you've got my email address there. Feel free to drop me an email. So as we can't meet face to face, I thought I'd just start by telling you a little bit about myself. So I'm a professor of medicinal chemistry here in the School of Pharmacy. I also work within the school within the academic team entitled pharmaceutics and pharmaceutical chemistry. So I've got a lot of research expertise in medicinal chemistry. In particular, I'm very interested in developing new treatments for cancer and for bacterial infections, ideally those which are very selective. And in particular, I try to develop drugs based on natural products. So I also have a citizenship and leadership role within the school, and that's the Wellbeing, Inclusion, Diversity and Equality Committee, where I'm the lead. So if we move on to the academic aspects of the lecture, I've got here some learned aims and learning objectives that I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through the lectures. So these lectures are entitled Reaction Mechanisms. So what we're going to be doing is thinking about how molecules react together to form new products. And there's some important reactions that we're going to be thinking about in this course because they're very relevant in terms of drug design and discovery. So in particular, we're going to be looking at nucleophilic substitution reactions and also elimination reactions. When we look at the mechanisms, so the way in which the bonds break and form to go from starter materials through to products, we're also going to be thinking about stereochemical consequences, because this will tell us a little bit about the 3D structures of the products and we'll see why that will be important. So when we're learning this basic chemistry information, we're also going to be putting this into context within your pharmacy programme. So we'll be thinking about how these reactions are synthetically useful for preparing molecules that have got a range of functional groups. And when we think about these functional groups and the molecules that we're going to prepare, we're going to see how they fit within biological and other systems with a focus on new treatments for particular diseases. Because we're interested in making drugs, what we want to also be thinking about is how can we actually influence reaction conditions so that we can make a particular reaction pathway occur and how we can form a specific isomer. This will mean we should then be able to access specific molecules in these processes which could be of interest within drug design and discovery. I've also got on this slide um, some learning aims and objectives based on the curriculum set out by the General Pharmaceutical Council. So they set out a number of standards that all MPharm programmes should address. So in particular, they're very keen that you can demonstrate how the science of pharmacy is applied in the design and development of medicines. So that's exactly what we'll be doing in this part of the course. They also want you to be able to identify ways that you can contribute to research and development activities to improve health outcomes. So I'll be trying to emphasise ways where research and development is still needed and where progress has been made in terms of better treatments and better health outcomes. Another standard that they want you to meet is developing knowledge that will allow you to communicate with patients about their prescribed treatments. So I will try to emphasise throughout the course why we're learning certain concepts so that if you are ever asked anything related to this by a patient, you can communicate that clearly. So often people will ask about recommended reading, if there's anything else they can refer to to advance their knowledge in this area. So I've listed here a book that I'd really recommend to you. It's Essentials of Organic Chemistry for Students of Pharmacy, Medicinal Chemistry and Biological Chemistry and it's authored by Paul Duick. Now this is available as an ebook in the library, so there's no need to go and buy this. You should be able to access this online. And in particular, I would refer you to chapters five and six for my course, but I think you will find this book really helpful in general for other, asp other aspects of the course this year and in further years. OK, so we're going to be looking at reaction mechanisms. So I just wanted to start off by giving you a bit of background. What is a reaction mechanism and why is it important? So a reaction mechanism is really this detailed step by step description of how a chemical process will occur 
so that reactants are converted through to products. So if we think about molecules reacting together, our reactants, and we think about how they are converted to products, what's going to be happening is we're going to be getting some bonds breaking and some bonds being formed. So in all reactions, we're going to have a sequence of bond making and bond breaking steps. And when we think about those bonds and how they're made and how they're broken, it's electrons which are moving. So what we're going to really be trying to do is look at starting materials so that we can predict how they will react to make bonds and to break bonds through the movement of electrons so that then we can understand what reactions are occurring. And once we can understand those concepts, then later on in the course, you might be able to start designing your own ways of approaching reactions so that we can come up with new ways of making molecules to treat diseases that might perhaps at the moment not have ways to be treated, or maybe those treatments aren't particularly selective. So we want to come up with new and more appropriate treatments. So really there's a series of rules, a series of principles that we can think about when we're approaching reaction mechanisms. And that's what we're going to be going through in this course, exemplifying it with particular examples. So when we think about electrons moving, we could move electrons via charged species, or we could move electrons via single free radical species, which are neutral. Now, if we move electrons by charged species, we're doing heterolytic reactions, whereas if we do um, reactions with free radicals, we're doing homolytic reactions. In my course, so in these lectures, we will not be looking at homolytic reactions. We'll be purely focusing on the heterolytic ones, but in other parts of the M farm, you will also look at homolytic reactions. OK, so just to recap, we're going to be looking at reaction mechanisms, which is where we're looking at the ways in which bonds might break and bonds might form to go from our start materials through to our products. We're going to be looking at the movement of electrons. And if we're moving electrons with charged species, we're looking at heterolytic reactions. If we're looking at movements of electrons using free radicals, we will be looking at homolytic reactions. So when we think about charged species, because I've said we're going to be looking largely at the heterolytic reactions in my course, when we're looking at charged species, we'll often talk about electrophiles and we talk about nucleophiles. So again, I just wanted to go through some definitions here. Hopefully you might have come across some of this before, but you know, let's go through the basics so you've got everything together. So when we talk about an electrophile, the electrophile is electron deficient and it wants to accept electrons in order to attain a filled valence shell. So if it wants to accept electrons, you could imagine it might be positively charged. Being positively charged, it's going to want, it is going to want to attract something negative. The electrons are negative. Or it could be neutral, but have an empty orbital in which electrons could be donated. So if we were to think of examples of an electrophile, we've said it can be positively charged. So for instance, H plus, that's positively charged. It's going to want to accept electrons towards it. That's a good example of an electrophile. We've also said it could be neutral with an empty orbital. So this molecule here, B boron with three fluorines, this actually has an empty P orbital. So that could also accept electrons. So that'd be a good example of an electrophile. So in contrast, a nucleophile is something which has electrons which are available for donation to the electron deficient centre. So a nucleophile is electron rich, whereas the electrophile was electron poor. So this nucleophile being electron rich has got um, electrons which it can donate. So the nucleophilic atom can donate two electrons. That might be because it's negatively charged and it's electron rich, or it could be because it's neutral but it's still electron rich because it's got a non bonding pair of electrons. So again, I've got some examples here. This one here, OH minus hydroxide. This is negatively charged. It's electron rich. That's a nucleophile. This one here, ammonia, so nitrogen with three hydrogens on. That is going to leave a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen here in ammonia. So that would be another example of a nucleophile because it's got a non bonding, a lone pair of electrons which it can donate. OK, so the electrophile, remember, is the electron deficient species. The nucleophile is the electron rich species. 
So the reason we're thinking about this is because when we make a bond, we're obviously going to be moving electrons from the electron rich area through to the electron poor area. And in mechanisms, we'll often have these curly arrows. So sometimes you might be asked to provide a curly or a curved arrow reaction mechanism for a process. And these are the sorts of processes that we'd be looking at. So in our mechanism, we're looking at how the bonds break and how the bonds form between um, reaction starter materials to make products. So there's a few rules we can think about. The first thing we would want to do is identify which species are reacting. So we'd be wanting to think about where's the electron rich area and where's the electron poor area. And we know obviously electron poor is going to be attracted to electron rich to make the new bond. So in words, what we could say is this part here, this hydroxide with the minus is a nucleophile which is electron rich. The H plus here is electron poor. So the electrons are going to want to move from the high electron area to the low, low electron area, which would then form a new bond between that oxygen, which had the minus on, to the H, which was positively charged, would form a new bond in this case to give us water. So we obviously can't always talk things through in words. It becomes quite lengthy. So you can do it in words or you can do it with reaction arrow mechanisms. So if we were to have an arrow mechanism, we always have the arrow going from the high electron density towards the low electron density species. So going from high electron density to low electron density, that's always the direction in which we're going to draw our arrow. So it says here that the curly arrows must start from the electron rich species. So this would be our electron rich because it's negative. It says here it could be a negative charge, it could be a lone pair of electrons, it could even be a bond. So we'll see that alkenes are electron rich in other parts of the course. They can act as the original point for this arrow in the mechanism. So when we've worked out where the arrow is going to start from the electron rich species, we then direct it through to the electron poor, the electron deficient species. Again, we've got examples here of what this could be. It could be a positive charge, as in this case. It could be the positive end of a polarised bond. We'll see that a bit later on in these lectures or any atom which can accept electrons. So we've spoken through this one. Hydroxide, the minus is the high electron density. Arrow goes starting from there through to the low electron density H plus, forming a new bond between the oxygen that had the minus and the H giving us water. This example here, so remember we saw on the previous slide where we had ammonia, we've got a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen, so that would make this electron rich. So our arrow would go from the high electron density through to the low electron density H+. Again, we would form a bond between here and here. So that means the nitrogen would now have four hydrogens on it. It had three initially, it's picked up another hydrogen, so it'd be NH4. We're probably used to balancing equations from previous times, previous studies before you came to university. What we always want to do is balance the atoms, but also balance the charge. So by way of example, here on the left hand side, we had a minus and a plus, so they neutralize each other out. So this here also has to be neutral. However, in this case here on the left hand side, we've got a plus. So that means on the right hand side, we must also have a plus and the plus is on the nitrogen because it's a nitrogen which gave up its lone pair of electrons when we formed this species. OK, so hopefully just to reiterate, this has shown you um, the first step of how to do a reaction mechanism. So what we would do is we'd be looking to identify high electron species, either because it's a minus or it's got a lone pair of electrons. We'd be looking to identify an electron deficient species. In these cases here is both positively charged, but it could also be because there's an atom which is capable of accepting electrons. We then draw an arrow from high electron density to low electron density. Note in both of these cases, we're moving two electrons. We've got charged species, so we've got this double headed arrow. It's a heterolytic process. And then we're drawing the product out in each case. 
So the best way to practice this and to make sure you understand what's happening is for you to actually have a go at drawing some curly arrow mechanisms yourself. So I've got an exercise here for you to try. To try. I'd like you to draw the curly arrows for the following mechanisms. And for each reaction, I'd like you to identify the nucleophile and the electrophile. So we've got one process here. So this is the first reaction you should look at. So identify where is your nucleophile, where is your electrophile, and draw the curly arrow to show how these reactants will combine to give the product. We've got a second example here. So again, we've got reactants here. We've got a product forming here. I want you to identify where is the nucleophile, where is the electrophile, and how do we give the arrows moving to give us the product. Now I'm going to actually um, give you part of the answer for this, because if you look here, I've called this NU minus. So just to be clear, this is an abbreviation for a nucleophile. Rather than write out nucleophile in full, this is just a general nucleophile. So in this second example, I'm telling you now that this is a nucleophile. I'm saying it could be anything which is minus uh, negatively charged. So I want you to think how a general nucleophile could react with this. This is a ketone, so it's got a carbonyl group to give this product. What I've also done, if we were face to face, I would tend to be writing the answers to this up on the board once you've had a chance to go through it. So what I've also managed to do is to go onto campus and record some accompanying videos um, using a document camera. So what I would like you to do is have a go at this exercise because only by trying it will you get the practice of drawing this out and knowing whether you understand these concepts or not. But when you've had a go or if you get really stuck and you can't see how to go about it, please also have a look at this video in your streams library. So I've entitled it PM1B Exercise Curly Arrows. So have a look at that and in that I will be talking through step by step how we go through this exercise so that you can yeah, see how you got on with that and hopefully get some tips for doing it if you struggled in the first place. OK, so I guess the overall theme of the lectures is reaction mechanisms, but I always like to show you why you've got to learn the particular material that you are learning about. So why is it important for you as pharmacists of the future to be thinking about mechanisms? Why is it important for you to think about any synthetic trans transformation? Well, the key here is you're obviously interested in um, drugs and how you can design them, how you can make better treatments for particular diseases um, which maybe don't have effective treatments at the moment. So we have to think about how can we make new drug molecules? Um, where can we get some ideas for what structures we might want to have within our drug molecules? Sometimes we can look to isolate materials from nature. So nature is very clever at making biologically and therapeutically active molecules, which can be effective for treating diseases. So sometimes we will get drugs from nature, but quite often we'll either need to make them ourselves because we can't get enough of nature from nature, or sometimes we want to make sort of derivatives that are going to have better selectivity, better stability, um, better yeah, just better medicinal chemistry profiles. And to be able to make them, we need to have a good knowledge of medicinal and synthetic chemistry. So I want to give an example here. Um, hopefully this will allow you to recap on some of the material that you've learned just um, this a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Sarah Allman. So you will have seen with her that we can get different isomers of molecules. And in particular, where we have double bonds, so alkenes, we can get E and Z isomers. So imagine you were tasked with trying to make some antipsychotic medications for therapeutic purposes. And supposing you were told, well, this here could be a good structure of a molecule that you might want to make because it's got antipsychotic activity. Well, if we were to look at this double bond here, which is the same in this molecule here, so this is an isomer, same as in we've got a double bond here, but here we've got a different isomer around the alkene compared to this one. So if you didn't have a good understanding of stereochemistry or if you didn't know reaction mechanisms and how we know which particular isomer we're going to get, you might end up making, say, a mixture of these two compounds 
if you weren't paying attention to the fact that we've got an isomer around this double bond here. The problem with that would be that this isomer here I've noted has got greater activity rather than this isomer here, which has low activity. So if you weren't aware of the mechanism, if you weren't aware of the right way to make the right molecule, you might end up making the one which had lower activity, which then would be less effective as an antipsychotic in the patient. So that's one reason we need to know about mechanisms is because they help us to know exactly what molecule we're making and how we can control certain features, such as the stereochemistry. Another reason that is useful to know about mechanisms and synthetic transformations in general is if we can introduce particular functional groups and if we know particular um, sort of stereochemistry around those functional groups, we can start to have an idea of the 3D structure of that molecule. And that's important because when molecules interact with receptors, as you'll see in PM1A, then it's important that they've got the right shape, electronics, orientations to determine whether they're going to be agonists, antagonists, etc. And that's very important in um, the way in which the molecules will work. So, for instance, again, if we build on material that you've learned with Dr. Sarah Orman, imagine you had an alkene. We know that where we've got an alkene, we know that the hydrogens are sp2 hybridized. If they're sp2 hybridized, then that gives us a certain bond angle of 120 degrees. So that would give the alkene a particular shape, a particular way in which it could interact with a receptor. Supposing though that this molecule here didn't have the correct shape to interact with the receptor, then what we might want to do is do a transformation to convert it to no longer be sp2 hybridized and 120 degrees bond angle, but instead say to be sp3 hybridized at both center and 109 degrees bond angle. So that would give a very different shape, a very different orientation, and that might give us opportunities to get different interactions with the receptor. So what we're basically saying is by knowing about our reaction mechanisms, we're going to be able to start to rationalize how we can make bonds, how we can break bonds, and the types of functional groups that we can introduce, and hence the types of um, shapes that the molecules might have, and then that might influence how they're going to interact with the receptors. So generally, when I deliver this class, so going back a slide, people will say, oh, do I need to memorize this structure? Do I need to know it's one with greater activity, etc." So in these particular cases, you would not have to memorize the actual structures. I'm just illustrating a concept here. So what would be important as a take home message is that by understanding our mechanisms, we're going to be able to have control over the types of molecules that we can make. And if we can control the types of molecules, we can control the types of isomers. And that can be important because different isomers have different biological properties. So again, here, you wouldn't need to know this specific example. Again, the take home message is if we can control the type of reaction we can do, we can control the stereochemical features of the molecule. We can control which functional groups we've got there, so where the electron density might be. And that, again, is going to give us interesting and exciting opportunities when we try to develop new methods for treating particular diseases. So before I finish with this sort of first part of the lecture, I just want to introduce to you the types of reactions that we're going to be looking at in great detail in these lectures. So we've had a general overview in this first part to set the scene and to introduce some important concepts and definitions. The mechanisms we're now going to move on to look at are going to be two main types of reactions. The reason I've picked these two is because they exemplify important points about sort of functional group um, introduction, stereochemistry, but also they are examples of ones which are widely used when people try to develop new drugs for treating particular conditions. So the first type of reaction that we're going to look at is the aliphatic nucleophilic substitution reactions. And what it involves is the replacement of one functional group on an sp3 hybridized carbon. So it's aliphatic because it's sp3 it's a sp3 hybridized carbon. We're going to look at this in great detail in the next lecture, but essentially what we've got is a leaving group, so LG for leaving group, 
and we're going to be looking at ways in which electron rich species, so our nucleophiles, can react with these molecules which are aliphatic with a leaving group in such a way that when we get our product, the nucleophile is now attached to that aliphatic chain and the leaving group has departed. So this leaving group is going to be pulling electrons away, away. It's going to be able to form a stable ion or a neutral molecule after it leaves the substrate. So this is one class of reaction that we're going to be looking at in subsequent lectures. The second class we're going to be looking at is elimination reactions. So in an, in an elimination reaction, we're going to remove a molecule of two atoms or groups without them being replaced by other atoms or groups. So generally, when this happens, we form a double bond. So we form an alkene. So here, this is an alkene that we're forming. It's a C double bond C. I haven't put other substituents on the carbon just to keep it simple at this stage. So essentially what we're doing is we've got a starter material. We've got a base which is going to remove a hydrogen and we're also going to lose the leaving group so that we make an alkene. So again, this is just introducing the reaction at the moment. What we're going to do is look at the specific examples in um, great detail going forward. Remember, why are we looking at these mechanisms? We're looking at them because they're useful in drug design and synthesis, and we're looking at them in particular so that we can think about how we make particular molecules with specific functional groups that can be important for interacting with receptors. We're also thinking about the particular stereoisomers that might be forming, and just always keep in mind different isomers can have different biological or therapeutic properties. So if we want to have a particular one with a particular activity, we need to always be thinking about the stereochemistry and how we can influence that when we do our reaction. OK, so I'm going to finish there for the first part of the lecture and we'll carry on next time um, on this slide. OK, thank you very much. And I will.